الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا هدى الله الحمد لله الذي انزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق النور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد الله أكبر صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستغ الصالقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يرثها عبادي الصالحون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى محمد الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد أبينا أبينا أن الله سبحانه وتعالى يرثها عبادي الصالحون صدق الله العلي العظيم and all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this life and giving us the opportunity to represent Him and to be given the opportunity to realize His infinite mercy through this very transient, lowest level of the heavens existence. For our spiritual existence is much higher than this worldly matter and what we are potentially capable of achieving is beyond the scope what we will be rewarded, inshallah, in the next world and forever. The potential is beyond concept. But Allah has placed us on this earth temporarily with all kinds of limitations, bodily limitations, animalistic limitations, in order for us to realize the enormous mercy of Allah. I think it's just the main goal of why we exist in this world. Allah wants us to subservience, through subservience, submit to him willingly without any hesitation وما يسلم وجهه إلى الله وهو محسن فقد استمسك you know the one who is uh, the one who is submitting his face willingly وما يسلم وجهه إلى الله and Allah has blessed us with this life and there's one thing that we all want in the process of this trial while we recognize God's mercy while we recognize his infinite grace is that we all have this innate desire for justice. And justice, I think, haq, you know, bilqis, as we say, haq, of course, is the universal justice, which is truth. But within its principles, when we say tawasaw bil haq, when you enjoin the truth, you're actually enjoining justice, bilqis. Wallah yuhibbul muqsiteen, God loves the peacemakers. It's the principle of Islam, justice, balance, equity. So you will notice in this world, life is filled with extremities, the potentials to do all kinds of things in the extreme forms. <clears throat> and extremities, as I mentioned, are here to stay. But we know when we act in extreme forms, we cause too much harm to ourselves or to those around us. It's just the nature. Even in prayer, you might think, what about extreme prayer? Where I pray so much to Allah, extreme forms, you will notice it is harmful and it is not in Islam. For example, we are all the time in, on the musalla, all the time doing our salah. All the time. And we have no time to eat, we have no time to socialize, we have no time to cohabit, no time you know, to produce children, no time to establish social services, no time to talk to anyone. We're all the time in dhikr. And there are people like that we've seen. Sometimes you'll see them even in public when they sit with you, but they don't trust me while they're talking to you. You know, they're doing tasbih while talking to you. I mean, that's extreme. In my opinion, that's not social behavior. Our prophets were not like that. You know, when you say, Salaam Alaikum, you're not doing tasbih while saying Alaikum Salaam. That's just extreme. It's not balance. So the one who prays too much too, excessive prayer is also not good. You might say, but isn't that what we were created? <coughs> isn't that why we were created? We were created to do ibadah. God negates it. We did not create you nor the jinn. You know, except to do ibadah. So am I not doing ibadah? Allah says, this is not the form of ibadah I enjoined upon you. Ibadah is for you to socialize, to be proactive, to go out and earn a living, 
to eat, to sleep. This is all ibadah. Tell me what is not ibadah. So ibadah, one form of ibadah is aqil salah maintain your prayers. But there's a time for it. You know, the Quran mentions three periods. Not five, three periods. Morning, afternoon, and night. And Allah mentions three periods. Though we have five prayers, but the Quran mentions three. But that's Allah saying between those three periods, if you calculate the amount of time we actually spend to do the wajib salah in a day, it's no more than 30, 40 minutes for the entire day. The actual salah is not more than 30, 40 minutes for the entire salah for the entire day. So in 24 hours, it's less than an hour allocation in prayers. That's not too much. Now, mustahabbat, if we do, which is the extrarogatory prayers, prayers which are not punishable if we don't do them, but they are rewardable if we do it. Allah says, do the mustahab, <clears throat> but do it at the time when you don't disturb others. So you notice our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do his mustahab prayers at night when everyone was sleeping. There are numerous, numerous rawayat, even Aisha, one of the wives of the Prophet, would, do, would follow him sometimes to see how much he is praying at night. And he would go, you know, on the hills and do his salah at night, you know, salat al-layl, tahajjud. And she would say to him, that why? You've already prayed, you've already been doing so much work for Allah. And the Prophet said, this is my relationship with my Lord personal, I want to talk to. There's a beautiful relationship. If you want Allah to talk to you, read the Quran. And if you want to talk to Allah, pray. There's a relationship. There's a formula. Anytime you want to talk to Allah, pray. Even mustahab prayers. But pray. And when you want Allah to talk to you, read the Quran. It's just a dual relationship. But the Prophet says, I like to do this. But there's a limit to what you do. Even the Messenger socialized. He established institutions. He guided people, he traveled. But well, how much did he excessively do? No. Our prophets were masters of balance. They knew exactly how much to do. So please understand that in Islam, the burden upon us is not salah. The burden upon us is to remove extremism. That's the burden. We have to constantly ask ourselves, how much should I eat? Like for example, eating. The formula in the Quran is beautiful. Allah says, Kulu washrabu wa la tusrifu. Innahu la yuhibbul musrifin. Eat, drink, don't overdo it. La tusrifu. Kulu washrabu wa la tusrifu. Don't overdo it. That's the formula to diet, by the way. You know, there's a trillion dollar diet business of all the pills people potentially take that can get, you know, they can get in shape. But the solution is, eat just the right amount. And Imam Rida alayhi salatu was asked this question. Oh. How much is kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu? What is la tusrifu? He says the first plate you take, that's enough. When you go for the second, watch out. And usually when you go to a restaurant, it's an interesting thing. When you go to a restaurant, you order a plate and there's a price to pay. Do you notice psychologically you get full when you finish the plate? But when you're at home and there's a whole pot of food, you just psychologically don't get full. Now, how is that reason? Because psychologically, when you've ordered one plate, you know you have to pay more to order another one. So somehow you just get full. You know, but when there's a big pay, you know, pot waiting for you, you just keep taking it because you feel this is all mine. I might as well just keep eating it. So it's all in the psychology. Even in the psychology, when you eat slow and you chew food, you tend to eat less. Because your stomach has sensors that once you start seeing food coming in, it starts to shut off the hunger. It's amazing in Ramadan, did you notice, because we've been hungry for so long, that the minute you put a few morsels of food, you don't feel like eating. That's a fantastic diet system. It's an amazing diet system. It keeps your body clean, pure, you know, lean, without extraneous materials, right? Because our bodies, as inefficient as they can be, they can be very efficient if we train them. And if we train them with a good, right amount of healthy food, with good psychology, you'll be surprised how you will get satisfied with a little morsel of food. And I often used to think how our blessed Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam You know how he would break very dry bread. He wouldn't even dip it in oil. You know, he would just have that with salt and a little water and he would be satisfied. And I'm thinking a desert dwelling individual who burns a lot more calories than us 
one who rides camels and horses. You know, it's very, very tiring to ride animals. Any one of us have ever gone riding, you know, when you ride a horse, when you're done riding a horse for 10 minutes, you get tired. <laughs> because you're constantly balancing and you're moving this animal. Imagine it was normal for them constantly to jump on a horse and they would ride camels even more because they bounce you all over the place, right? And you're moving with them and you have to constantly straighten out your back. It's very tiring. And they used to do it for days and months traveling. And that's why you notice that their consumption actually technically should have been higher. But Allah is merciful that the food he put in that region is very rich in sugars. You know, the glycemic index of dates is very high, specifically to compensate for that kind of loss. So you notice dates, and when you eat that kind of food within those tropical regions, Allah has balanced. That's why tropical fruits are not very healthy to eat in non-tropical countries. Because they're designed for people who burn calories. But look at coming back to كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Imam Radha says, that first plate. Then stop it. You notice most diseases come from the mouth. That's why the other day I mentioned dental hygiene. Go to the dentist. Make sure you have yourself checked at least once a year, if not twice a year. Make sure you floss your teeth to keep your teeth clean. Right? And all dental hygienists will tell you most diseases start from the mouth and then the stomach. And if these two are carefully modulated, then we cut down our policies of insurance with healthcare problems and we become very healthy. The Quran has given us the finest injunction possible, I swear, even coming from a scientific background. Nothing can be more, better saved from a scientific angle than giving everything its proper due. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Now examine on a grander scale. You will notice even principles of physics demands that we have what we call stasis, equity, balance, bringing things to, to, you know, to, to an equitable position. Even in science, we have the Chatelier's principle, when you push an object, it moves. And the reason it moves is because it wants to relieve the pressure. That's why objects move, by the way. When you push something, it moves, because it wants to relieve the pressure. That's why calisthenics, when you push a wall, you build muscle mass because it makes you stronger, but it's, re it's, it's challenging you back. But the general rule of physics is that things move to give itself peace. It's the law of nature. Even when you look at it, I'm giving a little science here. Science 101. <laughs> when you eat foods with antioxidants, you know, omega-3 antioxidants, good food like onions and garlic, they're very rich in antioxidants. Now, for those of us who don't know, just a quick explanation. And it's amazing when you look at even at the food level, at the physical level, at the electronic level, at the molecular level, you see the principles are the same as what I'm going to continue in my conversation today. You notice it's universal, what we call ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Now, when you and I eat food, especially sugars, sugars create a lot of free radicals in our bodies. And free radicals in the simplest is a loose cannon flying around in your body stuff that hurts you, bouncing around and hitting you like bullets ricocheting. And when you have antioxidants, it captures it and neutralizes it and brings harmony and your body becomes free. And in other words, it becomes safe and it doesn't age as quickly. So notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these kinds of you know, vegetables and certain kinds of fruits Allah mentions in the Quran, you notice deep in them, they're designed to bring harmony. He creates, right? He gives us food and drink. And when we're sick, He cures us. Allah has balanced it all within the system of His ecosystem. For every disease, there's a cure in the ecosystem. In fact, most of the great cures that we have, even in the homeopathic world, they come from natural resources. Even in the regular chemical world, they come from, in, uh, from instruments that Allah has created, entities that Allah has created that solves our problem. It brings harmony. But we need to know that when I have this problem, how do I counterbalance it? I have this venom. What is the antidote to the venom so that I neutralize? Neutralizing is a law of nature. 
That's what brings health. So now today we talk about the desire for justice, the desire for spiritual neutrality, the desire for which to us to reach spirituality of higher stages, but we can't do it if our souls are turbulent. We can't do it if we're filled with anger. Allah says, what's the antidote to anger and destruction? Dhikr of Allah. Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. Allah says, Allah, Allah, I mean, wow, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making an expression here that the remembrance of Allah makes the hearts calm. It doesn't make us wild. It doesn't make us wretched people. It doesn't make us angry. Most people suffer in this world because of anger, easy anger. Whereas Allah in the Quran says, well, qadineen al ghayb they hold back their anger. Wal-afeen anil nas, they forgive mankind. That quality, the antidote to the diseases that you and I possess, is not easily accessible unless we're cognizant, unless we're reflective, unless we have Allah in our hearts. I promise us all that if Allah does not reside in our hearts, it's an empty vessel. It's a dangerous vessel that gets angry and it kills the Lenin, the Stalin, the Hitler, the Muawiyah, the Yazid, the Saddam style, and to that the Saud style. They kill because they're angry. Whereas balanced individuals don't get angry. When you talk to them, they assess. Even if you say bad things to them, they don't get annoyed. They look at you, they assess. How are they not able to get annoyed? Do you know? You can increase the volume a little bit. How are they not able to get annoyed? You'll notice, for example, if I told you, here's a young brother, young brother, right? If I was able to tell him the events of the future, that this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. But the ultimate result is you will succeed. And he has that in his mind, fix. And now somebody comes and says something bad to him, I promise you it will be very difficult for him to get angry. Because he's already got the mental image of the future. He already knows what will happen, so why stop at this tree that fell in front of me? Let me not get angry. Let me jump over it and move on. You will notice that when we have that attitude, that, so to have yaqeen of akhirah, to have yaqeen of judgment day, to have yaqeen of bi uh, mission and vision of dunya as to why I exist on this earth, you notice it's very difficult to get angry. But if I live by the day, for the day, happy, go lucky, for the day, and I have not planned for the future, then every event that meets me is the ultimate event. And sometimes, God forbid, when I do get angry and my irritability state increases, my whole logic flips on its head and my rationality changes. And I start thinking I'm the most right person and everyone around me who disagrees is the most wrong person. But did you notice when you calm down and you look back at what you just say, you say that was the dumbest thing I ever said. Now why did I say that? Because in the state of anger, everything looked right my way. So Allah says, وَقَاذِمِينَ well, الْغَيْبِ They hold back their anger. So the antidote to holding back anger is long vision, understanding. But nothing is greater in long vision than having Allah as my dhikr. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَتْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُونَ Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah, Allah, Allah. So justice is universal. Let's go to every religion in the world. You will notice every major religion in the world, even the smaller ones, agree that there will come a moment when there will be justice on earth. Even if you go to, for example, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, that's a Christian branch, they say there will be Armageddon, and then this earth shall remain as a paradise forever, and there will be justice and equity. You go to Jews, they believe in the coming of the Messiah who will establish justice. You go to the Christians, they will tell you there's a second coming of Christ, <clears throat> Isa alayhi salam, which will bring justice and harmony in the world. Notice. It's a universal principle. Even when atheists ask me that question, one lady who was an atheist said to me, I don't believe in God. So I said, for what reason? She says, well, I have no evidence. I said, okay, let me ask you the question then. Do you believe in justice? She said, yes. I said, if your loved one gets killed, do you want to bring justice to the one who killed your loved one? She said, yes. I said, why? If there is no God, and you have no purpose, and when you die you all become nothing, 
Why do you bother? She looked at me. She says, hmm, interesting thought. I said, yeah, your child has died, and the killer will die, and they'll all become nothing anyways. So why bother? Why make a big deal out of it? At the end of the day, it's all nothing anyways. So don't bother with it. She says, no, I can't. And she teaches death and dying in the university, by the way. She's a professor. She says, no, I can't. I can't sleep at night. I said, so you find out the murderer. She says, yeah, then I can sleep better. At least I know who, who killed my child. I said, why? Is it a sense of perception in your head? Isn't that what atheists accuse us, believers in God, that we concocted this idea of God to satisfy us? So why do you have this innate desire to satisfy yourself about finding out who killed your child when it's all meaningless anyways? So isn't that a concoction of thought too? She looks at me and she says, no, it's something innate in all of us. I said, have you wonder why it's innate in us? Why is it that we all want justice? Justice is the bedrock of all conversations. Justice. SubhanAllah, Imam Ali alayhi salam was asked this question. Which is better, generosity or justice? For generosity, when a person gives generous, they are sacrificing themselves. Isn't that superior to justice? Imam Ali alayhi salam explains. He says, justice is universal for all. Generosity is only one moment by one person to a group of people. So justice is superior to generosity. Justice is giving everything its proper due. Then when you give more after that, that's rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us more than what we deserve. It's nothing but rahmah. So that's beyond understanding. Please understand. But justice, tawasu bil haqq. So what is my conclusion tonight, my last lecture tonight here in this IUS wonderful community? Inshallah, more spirit will come even after we leave. But tonight, I want to discuss the preparation for Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu wa salam. It's on the same premise. Why? Allah in Surah Al-Qasas says, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْئِفُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّ وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ It is our desire to make you, O oppressed ones, inheritors and leaders. Hmm? Leaders. Meaning make you imams, leaders. Now this of course Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu was salam recited after he was born. They say Imam Hassan Askari alayhi salam was holding him with his two hands and this little infant was reciting وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ صُطِفُ فِي الْأَرْضِ I was created to bring justice on earth. For that is the premise for all of humanity. That we want equity, justice on this earth. We don't want this foolish discrimination that takes place where 1% of the world's population is controlling 95% of the global resource. This is highly unjust. Where the banks of the United States can cause destruction and havoc to the societies and the first people who get bailed out are the banks themselves. The very bank, the Federal Reserve, which loans money to the United States government. The United States government borrows money. Think about that. The most powerful nation in the world is indebted to the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve has the power to print as much money as it wants and it is never audited by the IRS. You want to see injustice to the max? Study this part of the world and see how banks get away with crimes every single day and we are all its slaves. And if you don't like it, they kill you. IMF, International Monetary Firm, the World Bank, these are institutions of controlling the modern day slavery. And we are all subject to it. And they have so much control on us, there's nothing you and I can do about it. We are praying that the Imam, when he comes, will shatter this and bring it down so that the distribution of wealth that is deserving for all of mankind is given in the right amounts, as Imam Ali alayhi salam used to do when he used to open up the building of Bayt al Mal, Salat al Muhammad al Muhammad. So we have this intadar. The Holy Prophet has said, Abdalul ibadah intadar al Mahdi. The best ibadah, a very good ibadah, is the intadar of al Mahdi. Now, if you and I were in the time of Isa, السلام, he was the Mahdi of the time. If you and I were in the time of Musa, he was the Mahdi of the time. 
the one who comes as a representative of Allah to bring equity and balance the way Musa came and he brought Fir'aun down from his throne and said, you are treacherous. Innahu taha. He has exceeded his boundaries. He has caused harm. He has enslaved an innocent group of people. And go and break him and break the shackles and free the people. That's the system of Islam. The system of Islam is the breaking of the injustices of the world. I can talk about every level. In Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah says, we have made you male and female nations and tribes so you know each other. لِتَعَارَفُوا The most honorable to Allah, as I mentioned, is one who is God conscious. You and I as Muslims, while we line up for Salah, there is so much arrogance in us. And I point this finger especially to myself. For we think we are superior to the darker skin. If a black man enters this room or a black woman enters this room, many of us will look down on them like they are naturally born slaves. This attitude is haram. We Muslims have it. And I say specifically to us all in this month of Ramadan, look in the mirror and go into sujood and say, Oh Allah, remove this, this, this bala in me. Remove this cancer in me. Because shaitan who worship longer than me, longer than all of us, in one stroke his arrogance was, he was brought down from his position to eternal damnation because of this arrogance. This is an imbalance in society. It is unaccepted. Our messenger was colorblind, was nation blind. See? It wasn't about Muhajir and Ansar. It wasn't about Meccans and people of Medina. To him, he was nation blind. He saw diversity. لِتَعَارَفُ when blacks came to him, they were his brethren. He took Bilal Habashi and made him a commander. Commander of the army. The slave owners who were yesterday slave owners who now became Muslims were biting their tongues. They couldn't believe that Bilal, a black of black men, was leading an army. But we have it in our souls, I swear, all of us. Come to Africa, come to places where people of different colors are and see how we practice Islam. We have our own little clique groups, our own little circles, and we de delineate ourselves based on geographical regions of where we were born, and then we deep down believe about, about our supremacy. This Imam Mahdi والسلام, despises, because he is the talking, walking Quran. And for you and I to think we're going to prepare for Imam Mahdi والسلام, while we have this bigotry in our hearts, forget it. It's not going to work. It's like trying to race when you have no fuel in your car. Try it, it won't work. You can't even start your engine. Because shame on us if we carry those kinds of attitudes. When we go into sujood, say, Oh Allah, every creation you've made is magnificent. I am beautiful and everyone around me is beautiful. Thank you. And it's my fabric of the universe that I can, I can interact with and let me not discriminate, but on moral grounds. I discriminate only on merit on moral grounds, on equity and goodness and people who are truthful and honest, that I do discriminate. That one I want to be around. And the ones who lie and cheat and backbite and are arrogant, I want to separate from them. That form of discrimination is obligatory upon us. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So how are we going to prepare? People say to me all the time, brother, how do I prepare for my Mahdi? I say to them, the simplest answer is prepare for Malakul Mawt. When you're ready for the angel of death, you're ready for Imam Mahdi because they're no different. In principle, they're both the same. Because when the Imam comes, you and I can't say, oh, let me go think about it now. Because most likely, you and I may join the army against him. It's an interesting fact in history, how many did our people kill when they were the same ones who called upon Allah to send one? Even Karbala, Imam Hussein's argument was precisely that your people of Kufa sent me thousands of letters. How is it that you have gathered against me, sharpening your swords against me now, when you are the ones who invited me to come and bring equity and justice against Yazid? What is wrong with you? Well, he has put too much money on upon us. He has offered us a lot. Amar Ibn Sa'd says, I have been offered the governorship of Ray. That's too sweet. And if that's what it takes to kill you, Abu Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam, if that's what it takes to kill you, then I will kill you many times because I want the governorship. Imam says to him, Oh, Omar ibn Sa'd, you won't even eat the wheat from Ray. 
Forget about becoming the governor. Even the wheat that comes from that town, you won't eat it. Ibn Ziyad built a white palace in Basra. While he was commanding in Kufa, he had a white palace being built in Basra. Imam says he won't spend a night in it. This white palace he built in Basra, he will not spend one night in it. He thinks this world is where his happiness is. Allah says, Al-Hakum al-Takathur, Hatta zurtumul maqabir. Abundance diversity. You think it's different then and now? You think our love for Imam Sahib is the man tomorrow comes and Imam calls us and the enemy starts throwing money at us or starts threatening us and says to us, silence yourself or else we will kill you. Mafia style. You think it's easy? Hmm? You know, Suleiman bin Sard was one of the ones who wrote a letter to Imam Hussein al He was imprisoned by Ibn Ziyad. He was put in prison. Why? Because they knew these are the movers. He was imprisoned until the Imam was sacrificed in Karbala. Then he was released. Then he was among the Tawabin who rose and brought avengement. You know, he avenged to some degree Suleiman bin Sard. So you find even Mukhtar Thakafi, the same situation, where Mukhtar had to rise again. But people like them, their spirit in rising against tyrancy, you'll find the tyrant will try to silence us. These public institutions, these microphones, these videos, these YouTube videos, you think they're not being monitored carefully? We don't know when the clamp will be tightened upon us. But who cares? As long as we can be witness on judgment, there they will try. Isn't that love of Ahl al-Bayt? Otherwise, what is? We say we believe in Imam Mahdi al we have intadar. You know what the meaning of intadar in its purest form is? Is when you love someone so much, you want to be like them. Well, you can't wait to see them. And you decorate your house. And you clean your house because the guest who's going to come likes your house to be clean. And you start to perfume your house. And you start looking good to welcome this person. And you start dressing nicely. In the metaphor world, that is why the intadar is so important. Do we have it? We just give lip service to the Imam. Adrikni, Asa. The Imam says, don't forget, 11 of my predecessors, of my, my father and my grandfather, had the same problem. The people kept saying, Adrikni, Asa. But why did they only have a handful of friends? When they walked this earth and performed the greatest feats imaginable, Imam Ali alayhi salam, the greatest feat imaginable after the Prophet was Imam Ali alayhi salam. Yet he had a handful of friends. How is that possible? The Imam is, is warning us, Allah is warning us, don't be lethargic and lazy in thinking that when the Imam calls you, you will be ready. We need to be preparing it. How? By first and foremost looking in the mirror and saying, how do I improve myself so that when the angel of death meets me, I will be satisfied to receive him. فَتَمَنَّهُ الْمَوْتِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Have the desire for that if you are truthful. Do we have that? Many of us don't have it. We're too busy with our worldly endeavors in trying to accumulate. I've seen people, the minute you do something good, they talk bad about you. They create rumors against you. They try to even derail you. I know with my own, I have seen it. We have the Wise Project in Houston. The minute it started, there were people who were so disturbed by this project. What's the project about? It's a facility where children come and they learn and they swim and they play basketball. And we have banquet halls and it's, it's a healthy, safe environment for education and for social services in the community. A multi-million dollar project purely to service the community in preparation for Imam Mahdi We have our own Muslims picking up the phone, calling to say, don't support this project. Don't put your money there. Don't even go there. I said, to have such kind of friends, who needs enemies? It's amazing. But it makes you wonder. The same people in the, in the front lines will say, Adrikni, Asa, Ya Sahib Al-Zaman. They are praying. The same ones who pick up the phone and say, hey, don't do this. I'm thinking, why are you not this very agency that Muawiyah and Yazid used to go after and pay big money? So that you sign the death warrant of Imam? Isn't that how it worked? Then what does it work? If there's one thing that I may not like your project, it takes a lot of effort to pick up the phone and dial. There's one thing to say, I don't support it. No problem. Maybe that doesn't deserve support. 
But to have the audacity to pick up the phone and call, I say it takes energy. And that why I say to enter hell, you have to work hard. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Preparation. Let me give you some examples of preparation. This is IUS. People say IUS. Tomorrow we're going to have dinner, we're talking about 20 years of IS. Some discussion, should we have another Ramadan program? Will IUS survive? You know, volunteers have apathy. Yeah, like as if this is some joke, you know, this place is just a joke. It's a building, you know. Families have contributed money, people have contributed money. People come from distant lands. Here are brothers from Oxford coming here to listen to lectures, right? From Birmingham, from London, from around. This is a joke, you think? You think these pillars are jokes? You think the ceiling is a joke? This is a witness on Judgment Day. This pulpit is a witness on Judgment Day that that finite time I had, I was busy discussing something and made it to count towards me. And maybe this becomes the foundation of the preparation of the Imam. Don't underestimate it. We underestimate it. These institutions, when we run them, it should not only be for the pleasure of Allah in spirit, it should be in preparation for the Imam that when the Imam reappears, as Allah has promised it will happen, that he makes a phone call and says, I like that institution. I want it to become part of my distribution in my justice on earth. Do you know how powerful that is? You and I under underestimate that? Every little business you and I have may become the agency. How do you know that? How do you know your business will not become the agency to do the Imam's work? How do you and I know that? But shame on us if we don't. Even if we're carpenters, we're builders, we're painters, we're doctors, our businesses, every one of them, will come in full swing when this justice system gets prevalent. Let me give you an example. There's a young brother I know in California. I speak about him often in my lectures, and I want to express it again here. He's a young physician who's an expert in emergency medicine. He's a young brother, well off, does well, six months in a year, he's on vacation. Six months in a year is on vacation. You find that he goes to Iraq every year, twice a year. And he started many years ago, he says, I'm going to Iraq. I'm going for Ziyar of Imam Hussain. I said, Ziyar of Imam Hussain. Look, he didn't take it as a joke to go in five star hotels, eat good food, come back and say, yeah, I'm a Ziyar. You know, I'm a Zawar. I went to Ziyar of Imam Hussain. I brought the turba. Anybody have a problem with TikTok? Turba is good. What's your meaning in it? What are you doing with it? Turba is sacred. Imam Ali alayhi salam's title is Abu Turab. It's sacred, just as turba to hold in your pocket or in action. He has a brother who understands turba. To give you an example. He goes, he says, I noticed in Iraq with this war, Iraq, the entire country of Iraq does not have emergency medicine. It lacks emergency medicine. There is no emergency room in hospital. So when you come at night, at 3 o'clock, let's say you have a bomb that blew up and now you are under a crisis, the physician who's going to treat you is not trained in emergency medicine. He said, that's a problem. He has one individual in California thinking of solutions and asks him, Brother Imran, why are you doing this? He says, I want to prepare for Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. SubhanAllah. I look in his face and say, where are people like you? That you're a doctor, you're well off, you're married, you're happy. Huh? You can build your nest egg in your empire and you spend two times a year in your, your own wealth. You go all the way to Iraq. He says, every year I go and I train. And now I've included the University of California, included in my movement, and they are now financing us to establish an official emergency medicine in the hospitals of Iraq, especially in Najaf and Karbala. SubhanAllah. He says, ask him why. He says, because Allah has given me this power. What can I do other than that than to establish something so that when my blessed Imam reappears, hopefully he will use it to bring harmony and justice in the world. Isn't that the most powerful message in the world? Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Do we do that? Are we thinking that? But look, within our community yesterday, a physician, a surgeon, talking to me. See, a humble surgeon, he's here in our crowd. He says to me, I did a hip replacement yesterday on an old woman, but she had a bit of a crack. I don't know if she will survive. She's all day. First, when I start my surgery, I seek grace with Allah. I say, I am just a conduit. I'm just a mechanic, a surgeon. You know, when you walk into a hospital and you see a surgeon, everybody stands up because you have a lot of respect for them, right? Highly accomplished individual. These are the ones who the life comes in their hands and they can manipulate. In one stroke, they can 
cause harm, but they're so careful. He says, I'm a surgeon, but I know God is the one who does it. I'm just an agent. I said, your humbleness, it hasn't allowed you to get to you. Ibadah, that's Ibadah. Then he says, after my surgery, I was praying all day that, oh Allah, I don't know if that woman will survive. That woman is not a Muslim woman. She's not a Muslimah. But he is a surgeon, cognizant of Allah, praying to Allah that while this woman is healing, that he's praying as a surgeon, not because of his practice, but because he cares for the human being's life to say, oh Allah, you're the one who brings cure. You're the one who establishes. When we have those kinds of people who build infrastructures within, within the community, the Imam is most pleased when we revere. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad. Justice and equity, brothers. You and I must stop backbiting. We must stop finding faults. We must be generous. We must be kind. When projects come, say, where can I put my pound? Where can I put my dog? Don't say, oh, I need to give you charity because, you know, you're begging. Think, how can I prepare for my imam? What pound, what dollar can I establish so that tomorrow this becomes the institution? Yesterday, to give you a quick example, we were leasing out a church, you know, for our Islamic programs. And they signed a lease with us. And then a few bigots from the church read on our website that we teach Quran. So these bigots came on strong against us and says, oh, we can't allow you renting our church because you are teaching the Quran. Can you imagine that? Now, they are a product of misinformation, disinformation. The Quran, Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ What we have revealed in the Quran is a shifa and a rahma. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارَةٌ And it increases nothing for evildoers but destruction. Here's a bigot. A bigot who is misinformed, ignorant, comes and says, we don't want you teaching Quran. My resolution says, really, you are a dying breed and you don't want us teaching Quran. What have you read of the Quran? Oh, we haven't read it. I said, in your utter ignorance, they say empty barrels make the most noise. At least go and read it. When people come to me and say, you have a disease. I say, you know, physicians, before they cure the disease, they go study the disease. Have you studied my disease? You know, when they come knocking at my door, sometimes they say, I have a disease, no problem. I'm grateful that you think I'm, I need to be cured. Thank you. There are two kinds. The ones that come sincerely to come and teach you, and then the ones who come and they push it down your throat. Both, in my opinion, are good people. But when they come and tell me that you have a disease, I say, no problem. Here is my disease. It's called Al-Quran. Take it and read it. When you find all the problems in it, come and we will talk about how you can cure me from the disease. They said, no, 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 we can't read this. I said, is that how the Christ taught you? Don't read it. Don't read it. Don't understand it. You know, Isa A.S. never preached in churches. You know that? There was no church in his lifetime. There was no such thing. There was no cross. The cross was created by Constantine the Emperor. So you say to them, did you understand this? Do you understand even the dynamics of what you believe in? Let us Muslims get together with the non-Muslims and say, let's look at what the Testament says. This verse that I quoted in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 105, Allah says, We have written in the book after the reminder, after the reminder being the Quran, we have written it that as for the land, my righteous shall inherit it. The meek shall inherit the earth. The meek. The righteous shall inherit the earth. This is in Zabur, in Taurat, in Injil, that Allah says, my representative on earth will establish it. This universal principle between Christians and Muslims is universal. But when they prevent us even from reciting the Quran, what is our resolution then? To run and be afraid or to stand up and say, that's one reason that you're telling me, like shaitan telling me not to pray, that aha, I do need to pray. So let us be vigilant that when we are attacked and we are called names because we are Muslims, Allah says, rise and don't be afraid. Look at the ayah in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, Muhammadur Rasulullah wal ladina ma'awa shiddawun al-kuffar. Ruhamau baynahum, tarahum, rukka'an sujjadan yabtahuna fadla min Allahi wa ridwana simahum fi wujuhihim min athari sujood. ذَلِكَ مَثَلُهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَمَثَلُهُمْ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ 
كزرع أخرج شطأه فأزر فاستغلب فاستوى سوقي سوقي يعجب الزراع ليغيب بهم الكفار If you know this last verse in the 48th chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Fat, Allah says, Muhammad and those who are with him, Muhammad al-Rasul, they are firm against this belief. They are merciful to each other. We don't fight each other, we're merciful. And we don't fight Christians and Jews, just kufr. And kufr is also within Islam. So it's not about fighting non-Muslims, it's about fighting any form of lying and cheating and debauchery in life. Allah says, Tarahum, you will see them. Rukkaan sujjadan, doing ruku and sujood. Yaktahuna fadla min Allah. They are seeking the grace of God. Dhalika mathalun fi Torah. These have been mentioned in the Torah which was given to Musa. وَمَثَلُهُمْ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ And it has been mentioned in the New Testament. In the Injil. Not the New Testament, the existing one, the Injil, the original Injil. We have what we call remnants of the true Injil. But even then Allah says, فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ But what Allah says, what do we do? He says, we establish them with firmness. You see? And it becomes a blessing for humanity. But it becomes a point of anger for the disbelievers. لِيَغِيدَ بِهِمُ الْكُفَّارِ It makes the kuffar angry. So when you and I practice Islam, and when a bigot comes to you and says, I don't like your hijab, I don't like your Muhammad or Hassan or Ali, I don't like this name, tell them, well, the world is wide. Maybe you need to wake up and smell the coffee. Because even in the UK, this country, which had one time ruled the world, which managed to come even into Africa, into Tanzania and East Africa, where Kiswahili was our, is our language, which originated from Arabic and Bantu. And these nations, the European nations who came and stole our lands, they Latinized our language to kill us to even have access into our religions. They Latinized Kiswahili and they took Arabic out of it. And now you see Swahili is written in Latin. It wasn't this way. They intruded. Why did they intrude? Because they don't want us reading Quran. They don't want us practicing Islam. They don't want us to be called Muslims. They want to call us Muhammadan. They want to call us terrorists. You want to prepare for Imam Sahib Zaman Al Salam? It's time and duty upon us to rise to the occasion and not be afraid. And if we say, Ya Laytana Kunna Ma'akum, that we wish we were with you. Ashhadu Annaka Qadakam Tassala, Wa Ataita Zaka, Wa Amarta Bil Ma'ruf, Wa Nahayta An Al Munkar, Wa Ataata Allah Wa Rasulu, Hatta Ataata Al Yaqeen. We say this, we bear witness, O Imam. You pray, you give zakat, you need all of that until you reach certainty. Allah will ask us, Did you really say, Ashhadu Annaka Qadakam Tassala? What did you do? Did you do it that when they called you, did you rise and establish institutions? This young generation, for example, right now, how many programs are available for them to be saved? You know why we're starting these programs in America? Why do we have a camp and we invite everyone to, the, to come to the camp? This camp Taha by Allah's grace, it's a blessing Allah has given us. It's the only Muslim camp in North America, some say in the world. It's recognized, we were attacked by them, we stood firm, we even went to court and we got our taxation rights, and we stood firm, and we're not afraid of them, and now we're respected. We're respected and we earn our ways. Why the summer camps? These children in the summer, what do they do? If you don't give them guidance, well, if children don't go to places where they learn certainty, they, lo they learn the Iman, they learn their deen, they learn how to socialize and understand the principles of Haya and Hijab, where are they going to learn it? Our children today are vulnerable. We send them into all kinds of programs. How do you know these programs are not poisoning the minds of our children? How do you know that their social, their, their companions are not poisoning their minds? Should we not take vigilant steps, upright steps to protect the future of our children? Or should we be subjected to what the rest of the world gives it to us, like as if we're a bunch of beggars? Or should we rise? And if we spend a few million dollars, you think we've given real charity? 
If we spend 10, 15, 20 million dollars, you think it's real charity? Allah says, I gave you billions of dollars. Where is all this wealth that you're using? Are you preparing for my next generation? Are you saving this young generation from becoming good role models for the future? Do we have those programs? Go around the country. In America, we hardly have high schools for our young Muslim audiences. We hardly have safety zones for The only time is come to the masjid, Hosseinia. Even then, we ignore them. Even in England, up to the 90s, it was taboo to give lectures in English. In England! Of all the places in England, it was taboo. Because God only speaks in Urdu. He only speaks in Arabic. No! Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمٍ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We never send messengers except by the language of its people so that they are taught and guided in their language. We are in these English-living countries. No one says give up Urdu. No one says give up Arabic. No one says give up Farsi. No! These are languages that must be nurtured all the time. But does it mean we ignore our next generation because somehow we've got a connection with Imam Hussain alayhi salam that that's our entry into paradise? What preparations have we made? I've seen generations lost. 30, 40 year old generations who don't even come to the masjid because when they were young, when they used to come to the Husseinias and the masajid, we wouldn't even talk in their language. So they'd go outside on the streets and smoke and hang out with their friends and go dating and go to McDonald's and hang out because there's nothing else to do. So when these children became lost and they married outside of Islam, he asked them, what happened? He said, no one gave us anything. On Judgment Day, we will complain on Judgment Day that these people who came and established institutions were so close-minded that they were not willing to talk to us in our lingo. That's the preparation of Imam Mahdi I conclude tonight with this dua that we recite in Dua Iftata. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wali أمرك القائل المؤمن والعدل المنتظر وحفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيده بروح القدس يا رب العالم اللهم اجعله الدعية إلى كتابك والقائمة بدينك استخلفه في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبل مكنه دينه الذي ارتضيته له Let me translate very briefly Oh Allah bless the garden of your orders This dua is about Imam Mahdi the one who will rise the one hoped for, the awaited justice, surround him with your favorite angels and assist him with the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord of the world. O oh Allah, appoint to him, appoint him to invite towards your book to establish a religion, make him the success on earth. Because when Imam Mahdi comes when he establishes, every religion will be ruled by its own freedom. Christians will be ruled by Christian law, Jews will be ruled by Jewish law, and they will find their law so burdensome they will give it up. It's historical. Even the Jews of Banu Qurayda, you know why they were those that disobeyed the Prophet were killed? They refused to obey Islam. They went to the Torah, and the Torah said, kill them. Deuteronomy 20, 21, read it. You'll see what I'm talking about. The, the Quran doesn't have such injunctions. And the Holy Prophet said about the Banu Qurayda when they were killed, he said, if they would have come to me for judgment, if they would have come to me for arbitration, I would have forgiven them. Because he is Rahmatun lil alami. Allah, in this dua, he says, make him the successor on the earth as you cause others to succeed before him. Establish for him his religion which you have approved for him. Give him security after fear so everyone worships you and none associates anything with you. O oh Allah, give him power and through him strengthen others. Help him and help others through him. Help him with a mighty help. Help him with an easy victory and grant him an assisting authority from you. We read this in Ramadan for 30 nights. Do we ponder? You know what it means, help him? It's you and me. What do I do in my little effort? What do I do in my little moments? What do I do to bring harmony and equity and justice in the world? This is the last lecture tonight. I know tomorrow I'll speak at the IUS program uh, for the um, fundraiser. But that's a short program, and I just want us to leave on this note that while we're in UK, we usually wake up in the morning wondering what the weather is like. Not that it's very predictable here. Um, but there are people in the Middle East today wondering if the bomb will drop on their heads today. Or they have to go and eat, and they don't know if the sniper will shoot them and they'll not come home. We have a completely different existence. And in Kuwait, at the beach, people were thinking they're safe, right? And an enemy comes and kills a whole bunch of them, right? What do you think? That security is only for us? I don't think so. I think this shaitan looms everywhere. It looms here, 
looms everywhere. And we need to be vigilant, and we don't know when we will leave. But I believe it's our obligation that while we make this dua, and we ask Allah to establish victory and justice in this dua, that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us proactive individuals, that maybe I get in the car and I have an intention to give charity and to establish something for the future of the ummah, and I die, Allah says, whatever gets created thereafter, the barakah is tawab jari. Let's think this way, and let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that strength that in whatever profession we are, that we become strong individuals, strong individuals who practice. A quick note about dua, and I end on this. When you and I pray, pray at the level of practice. When we ask Allah, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزَّقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِلْهَلَيْتَنَا Our Lord, do not let our hearts go astray after you've guided us. Because we believe the power of prayer is in action. Action, sincerity, principle uprightness. Now you pray for anything Allah will give you. Simple, quick examples. It'll take five minutes. I want you to understand. Because this is the month of dua and prayer. You will notice that Nuh salam, was a prophet. A prophet of God. And when Nuh prayed to God, Allah never refused him. But notice in the Quran, Marhum Sayyid Mushtaba Musa Bilali has written a book, you know, The Hidden Truths of the Quran. He talks about prayer and dua in this book. I highly recommend you to read it. It's available online for free. Sayyid Lari's book, Lari, musabilari.org, I think. Read this. He describes the power of dua. It's, it's amazing. And say, Marhum Mushtaba Musa Bilali was an erudite, a learned scholar. I met him a few times. I was extremely <coughs> taken by his incredible, uh, august character, incredible character. You find that in his writings, he said, look at Nuh alayhi salam, that while his son is drowning, Nuh prays to Allah, what about my son, save him. And Allah says, no, he is not from you. Now imagine, this is his own flesh and blood. This is a father begging to God that my son should be saved. Allah says, I have a principle. If you willfully reject me, and you work against my principles of establishing good and justice on earth, even if your father is a prophet, I don't accept you. So what's the rule then? Follow. There is no specialty to say, oh, I'm Sayyid, I belong to the family of the prophet, so I've somehow now I've got this immunity. Okay, Nur's son was also a Sayyid. What happened to him? How come he wasn't saved? Because Allah says, I have a principle, inna akramakum in Allah yadqaakum. I have a principle. But Allah says, now flip it the other way. And Allah says, look at Ashab al-Kaf. Am hasibta an Ashab al-Kafi wa al-Raqeen. Kaanu min ayatina ajaba. Ith awal fitiyat ila al-Kafi. Faqalu rabbana. Aatina min ladunka rahma. Wa hiyya lana min amrina rashada. What happened to the youth of the cave? There's a movie. The Islamic Republic has made magnificent movies. May Allah bless this nation for making such kinds of educational movies where the rest of the world is making movies that distract us from goodness. They're making movies that teach us history like the history of Yusuf the history of Mukhtar. What a brilliant presentation. Well, in fact, our respected scholar, Sheikh Bahman Poor, is the one who wrote this movie. May Allah bless him. He's in London. A great scholar who made this, who wrote this movie, as al -Kaf. I watch this movie often, and Allah says, take lesson from us, Habakkuk. You know why that movie resonates with me? Because it's in the Quran, it's real. And in that movie, you find these youth, rich, they were wealthy, well-to-do. But the king of the time said, bow to me, I'm your God. They said, no. The same principle today, when the West tells us to bow to their principles, we say, no, we are Muslims. We rise and we bow to none other than Allah. Allah says, notice, they could have been hung, they could have been crucified, killed tortured, but they prayed to me. Allah says, have you taken example about them? That they had no idea what I was going to give them. This is the power of dua. He said, they prayed to me. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma. One rule of thumb, when you want to pray, two principles the Quran says. Ask from Allah's infinite treasury and let Allah decide my destiny. Let me not tell Allah how I want it. Say to Allah, I want to be your servant. I want to do good. If you're going to take me to Antarctica and that's where I'm good, then take me there. If it means six feet down to die, then let me die. Whatever you think is Rashada. Allah says they went and they stood against the king. 
and they have no idea whether they'll be crucified. I guided them to the cave and I put them to sleep for 300 years and I moved their bodies left to right and then I rose them 300 years later and I asked them, go now see the tyrant king who had authority over you. They have become dust and you are still alive. Look how I respond to someone who prays to me. Read this dua. ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا. Then when we do His work, we say, Oh Allah, I resign to You. Take me whatever, wherever You want to take me. Take me. I just want to be Your servant. And I pray that our blessed Imam reappears soon in our lifetime. It appears that that's going to be happening soon because the lovers of Ahlul Bayt are the most powerful people in the Middle East today, hands down. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's not a secret, even the giant nation that rules the world with a simple iron fist and you have a foreign minister of that nation looking eye to eye to the foreign minister of this giant Goliath and here's Dawood standing and says, back off. And Goliath is trembling. And this Dawood has become established so well, it's getting so powerful that all the shayateen can't sleep at night. If this is what not one read one ladina stadhu, take hope in that and say, Subhanallah, our deen is taking footings and the world is recognizing Ahlul Bayt and they're recognizing our school, the Deen al Haq, Liudhirahu, Ala Deen Kulli. It is going to supersede over all religions. But let us pray, let us be active and proactive, and let us be good. Bismillah Rahman, it's an honor, my brothers and sisters, really, to be among you. And forgive me for my shortcomings. And forgive me for making statements that I may not have intended to say. For if I did, forgive me due to my ignorance. But I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant every one of us the strength to be his good role model. And to grant us the strength to be with the Imam when he appears, inshallah. To be his friends, his helpers, not his enemies. And to establish good in this world. And may Allah grant us the status to be sadiqun as sadiqun ulaikal muqarrabun the foremost of the foremost <coughs> who will be the closest to God the ones who would enter paradise because they will be the first ones asked to, par to ask, enter paradise we pray to Allah to grant us that status sadiqun as sadiqun ulaikal muqarrabun fi jannatin na'im they will be the ones who will enter without any questions I pray for all of us I pray for all of us who are sick who are ill for those who are dying of cancer, for those of us who've got problems. And I pray <coughs> Allah brings shifa to all of us quickly and gives us the best life so we serve Him the best. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this mayhem and havoc is taking place, the hell in the Middle East, where our families are broken, disrupted, killed, shattered, and they have no hope. It, it appears they have no hope. And we pray, oh Allah, that while we are secure, while we come in good cars and we live in good homes and we eat good food, that oh Allah grant them that security and tranquility and grant them much success in dunya wal akhirah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadhi al-sa'ati wa fi kulli sa'a waliyan wa hafidhan wa qa'idhan wa nasiran wa dalilan wa ayna حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين I must say I'm very honored specifically for one reason in this lecture that this young group of boys and girls have been sitting carefully listening having been fidgeting paying attention this really makes this trip priceless may Allah bless you السلام عليكم